This is the Meat Eater Podcast coming at you shirtless, severely bug bitten, and in my case, underwearless. Meat Hunt, the Meat Eater Podcast. You can't predict anything. The Meat Eater Podcast is brought to you by First Light. Whether you're checking trail cams, hanging deer stands, or scouting for elk, First Light has performance apparel to support every hunter in every environment. Check it out at firstlight.com. F I R S T L I T E.com. Okay, we're at the Cornell Lab of O. You know, that's what they call you guys over in the disease part? Oh, yeah. You're the Lab of O. Nice. The Lab of Ornithology. And we are seated with um, someone who we've inadvertently talked about a whole bunch. That's not right. We talked about without naming your name. Because we have again and again and again on the show, on social media and otherwise, brought up the, um, the Merlin Bird app. And have often said, we ought to get the person that made the Merlin Bird app on the podcast. And here she is, Jesse Berry. Hey, it's great to be here. Yeah. Uh, joined as well by an ornithologist, Chris Wood. And if you are into um, eBird, top, we've, I'm going to go back around on Merlin and explain eBird. Yeah. So the idea of eBird is there's thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people around the world that like birds like watching them. This is a place for those, all your observations of birds to go into a centralized database. You can see that information, but even more importantly then a, a team of scientists can analyze that information. That information is then used by groups like Fish and Wildlife Service um, and others for policy action. Yep, and we're gonna, and Chris is gonna explain how you can exploit eBird to get uh, better bag limits. On ducks. Oren's going to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm joking, but we're going to get we're going to get into Ebert, and then Oren Robinson, another ornithologist. Yeah, so I work with the data after it comes through Ebert and, and all the filters. Um, we can create these these distribution maps um, for thousands and thousands of species, and we can take that eBird data and use it in conservation or management applications. And you're a duck hunter? Yes. Where'd you grow up? Grew up in Mobile, Alabama. Okay. You still hunt there? Not very often. No? Or where do you, where do you mainly hunt ducks now? Uh, Arkansas. We've got some good family friends in Arkansas. Okay. So I go over there once a year. Do, uh, do you often meet other ornithologists who are disappointed to hear that you're a duck hunter? Or is that pretty common? In the duck world, uh, mo most of the folks that study ducks are also duck hunters. Yeah, uh, I can picture that. that. I found. People that study uh, the ducks hunt ducks. Yeah, you know, but uh, no, I haven't really gotten any any pushback on the fact no. that I uh, <laughs> I enjoy duck hunting. It makes sense to people. Yeah. All right. Um, we got see. So I'm gonna explain Merlin real quick, or you could probably do a better job explaining Merlin. But I'll explain my how it came to me. Giannis Putellas, who's on the show all the time. Um, it used to be on every episode of the show. He found out about it and told me about it, and I got into it. It's an app. You open up the app. You can go to Sound ID, and it just starts populating with whatever birds are going on. Um, I got a lot of questions about how this functions and some other problems, but then we started having a lot of fun of raiding each other's turkey calls, whether you can trick Merlin, um, getting into trying to fool Merlin in other ways. And also a sort of a slight, a little bit of a contest about who can get the most birds going at any one time. Um, and I'm not that high. I, I had nine going in, in Eastern Kansas this year, which I thought was pretty good. But I've met many people who've been, who've had in the teens in any one sitting, but I had nine in I don't know, you know, 20, 30 minutes leaning against one tree, which I thought was pretty impressive. Uh, I've also found it helpful for when you're somewhere and you, like in Southeast Alaska, there's this bird I'm always hearing. I can't remember what the hell it was, even though I looked it up. You never in a million years are going to get a chance to see it because it's in the canopy of old growth and able to like figure out what you're listening to. So if you get Merlin, it's free still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, still free. You guys probably steal people's data. No, no. It doesn't feed back? It doesn't feed back, no. It's What's still the whole point? totally separate. So we get people excited about watching birds, and then hopefully some of them start contributing data to the eBird, and that's where Why we can really Why would you not just it. steal whatever anybody's hearing? Yeah, you know, we're, t we're still trying to be like above the line on some of these things, and when we you make know, that shift, you know, make it very intentional that, you know, we're not just listening in, we're not eavesdropping on you. Oh, no, yeah. but I would, like, so this doesn't report back to you? I it, thought that'd be the only thing you have to gain from it. It doesn't right now. We'll make that step 
coming up in the next few years. Here, oh, but, I've been just yeah. assuming, and that's why I felt a little bad when we're messing with it that I would throw off some data. No, set. it's okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We want <laughs> people to have fun just enjoying the app. And then when we're collecting real data for science, we want, you know, that's a different thing. And we want people to know that too. Yeah. Uh, hunting turkeys, you know, it's humiliating if someone has Merlin open and someone calls <laughs> and it doesn't recognize it as a wild turkey. It's humiliating. Yeah. Um, then we got into this spring trying to do a barred owl, an owl hoot, which it's humbling. Um, pileated woodpecker calls, humbling, crow, crow, tough, tough, yeah, raven, tough. You can beat it on a barred owl. I can, yeah. Can I test yeah. you? Yeah. Oh, it doesn't like yeah, you know okay. what? It doesn't like noises in rooms though. Have you noticed that? Yeah, there. It's um, you know, really tuned in for the outdoors. So all the data that Merlin has used to learn these sounds is coming from outside. So yeah, it's not as good on the inside. Do you dare try to do a test? Yeah, sure. You'll do yeah, it? Yeah, I'll play. Okay. Got it on. I can see my voice bouncing up and down. Okay, you ready? Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, nice. All right. <laughs> <laughs> right there. Now, uh, my buddy Seth, he, we had one in Southeast Alaska this year going nuts, couple of them in a tree, and he, for two nights, sat out with Merlin open, it calling, Merlin binging it. He couldn't get it. He eventually got it, and he feels that it's in the hall. Yeah. You, the yeah, hall. You got to get it's the modulations like, in there. Yeah, it's yep. very picky. Yep. Now, ooh, here, ooh, here, ooh. yeah, that's where he, he had to work on that, and once he worked on that, he was able to get it, but he wasn't quite clear on what he did. But all of a sudden, he got it where it would trick it. But here's the thing I don't get. I have the Bird Song Bible. Are you familiar with the Bird Song Bible? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Team here put that up. Yep. That was you guys? Our sounds are in there. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Well, weirdly, my kids like to mess with the Bird Song Bible. Um, the Bird Song Bible can't fool the app, but it must be something going through recording and coming out the other side. It loses some yeah. essential S elements. So, um, the sounds in that particular, you know, book with the little speaker are really compressed. And that was, you know, 10, 15 years ago when there just wasn't the technology to put a good speaker next to a book. So, yeah, those sounds have been shrunk down so much that Merlin can't really see the signal. I got it. So that's what it is. I think right. so. Yep. Uh, I, I didn't know this was you, but I came into contact years ago with, and, and I want you to start by ex explaining the Macaulay Library, but years ago... I was trying to figure out a game call for a blue grouse, which leads me, I got to digress because it leads me to another question. Do you guys know how they try to make the blue grouse into two different grouse? Mm -hmm. Do you believe that? Or, I mean, do you buy that? Like who gets to decide? Yeah. So there's it's a, like, it seems like it'd be up to God. <laughs> that's one, that's one perspective. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, I, I think, I think the thing is, is, um, there's really no such thing as a species, right? It's an yeah. artificial construct that people have invented to try to make sense of the natural world. And there's certain things that are, that are really, you know, obviously differentiated and other things that are, that are very, very close and it's hard to understand. And so in the case of what's now these two different species of, of grouse, they're separated, you know, a little bit basically one of them is in the Pacific North Northwest. The other's in the Rockies, the, the sooty, sooty and dusky, the sooty in the Pacific Northwest, the dusky in the Rockies. Yeah. Right. And, and so there've been a series of studies and right now, usually what people are looking, what scientists are looking for is they're, they're looking for a combination of vocal differences. Mm -hmm. And so those two, those two species, as we're considering them now do have very distinct vocal differences. Yeah. The sooty. number of, the number of, ooh, ooh, yeah, ooh, 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 is different. Ex exactly. And one of them, you know, Sooties will sit up in trees yep. to give those. Dusky grouse basically sit very, very low to deliver those those vocalizations, and or right on the ground. Exactly, like at, at most, like a foot up, right? Yep. And and so those that mating behavior is a very strong sexual selection pressure. Okay. That that sort of as that happens over hundreds and thousands of years, they they really start to become distinct populations and so species. Is the idea that they're um, 
is the is the split widening with them like the connectivity diminishing with them you know i don't know i don't know the specifics uh-huh. of that but what's likely to happen is is as you're seeing sort of the the combined effects of climate change and then just human cause changes in in forests it's likely for that to to shift over time. Mm-hmm. And so that's something that we're increasingly seeing with a lot of kind of species limits. I don't know the specifics of, of those of those two individuals, but one it, of them has a different color eye comb, right? Or they one of them has tends to have an orange and one it, has a tends to have a yellow it, eye comb. Yeah, and there's some differences in the tail band okay. as well. But but part of that gets confusing because there's different subspecies within each of those populations as well. And so there's there's subspecies of of dusky grass that have broad tail bands, others that have narrow tail bands, and so it actually does end up getting to be quite a bit more confusing. And and what happens is, grouse in general don't travel very long distances. They're they may migrate, but they're they're elevational migrants, particularly those in the Rockies. Um, they're not moving, you know thousands of miles like Swainson's thrush. And so what that means is that there's, it's more likely for those popula- for those birds to sort of diverge um, and not come into contact as much as other... Sorry, the lights just went out. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> what looks happened. fine, but... <laughs> there we are. There it is. <laughs> and Warren said, let there be light. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. So go on. And yeah, I mean, so so because of that, that that's there's a whole bunch of different things that that come at play at sort of how things end up end up diverging into separate species yeah. but it's a very very dynamic process mhm um our fish and game agency they have not made the switch hmm. so they are still blue grouse they've not moved them to dusky grouse they have uh when you go in to do bison they do bison but not buffalo pronghorn or antelope but not pronghorn and blue grouse are blue grouse but not dusky grouse i made the switch but then i switched back now i'm thinking about switching back again i think you should so i'll continue with switching i wanted to make a sooty grouse call because in alaska you can hunt sooty grouse in the spring but they're hard to find up in the tree but they'll call and it's the male up there, right? Ooh, 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 ooh. And I thought you could hide and then nick, 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 draw it down. So I had a guy I knew that's a game call maker, and I was sending him all, I was trying to find good vocalizations, and I wound up sending him all the Macaulay Library blue grouse, sooty, excuse me, sooty grouse records. And I had no, until the other day, I had no idea that, that was you guys. Yeah, so the Macaulay Library started back in 1929. The very first bird songs were recorded right here in Ithaca. Uh-huh. And so, really? yeah, yeah. yeah, it was uh, the collaboration between Arthur Allen and Peter Paul Kellogg. And Arthur Allen was an ornithologist, Peter Paul Kellogg, an engineer. And they were just trying to figure out how they could study, you know, birds, you know, more carefully. And so they are using the technology of the day to go out and record those behaviors, which ended up being a bunch of equipment um, used for films. So... That early film technology enabled us to start to document these wildlife sounds. And, you know, we're still have folks all over the world who are going out and recording birds and other wildlife and bringing them to the archive here. Does anyone have, uh, they must, but early we got to go hold, uh, you know, the extinct, you have three, was it two or three ivory billed woodpeckers, three, two males and a females in your collections. So, uh, we're able to hold the extinct ivory billed woodpecker. Um, the extinct Carolina parakeet um, observed, but did not hold the heath hen, which was like a basically a, I don't know, man, it'd be like a sharp tailed grouse that lived in Martha's Vineyard. You know, uh, does they, are, are there recordings of their calls? So there are recordings of ivory billed woodpecker. And a little bit of motion picture film too, which we have yep. in the back room as well. Those, in the, those yep. from the Singer Forest, wasn't yep. it? Yeah, yep. yeah. Uh, we don't have any heathens or Eskimo curlew was never recorded. I don't think Carolina parakeet was either. So yeah, a lot of those you know, species that were went extinct in the early 1900s missed that window of being recorded. Ivory is one of the few that we were able to capture. Yeah. So walk me through from 
from starting from the Macaulay Library, how did how, like how many bird sounds are in Merlin? Merlin can cover um, a thousand species in the sound ID feature where you can hit record and Merlin can identify them. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, now 10,500 species of birds that you can you know, explore and listen to right from the app now. So basically all the birds But it can the recognize a thousand. Yep. And as we get more data coming into the archive, we'll be able to add more species. So it takes a lot of... Uh, example recordings and uh, and experts to help Merlin you know really dig into learning what those that species sounds like. Yeah, when you um, you know, uh, like many people, I'm reflexively anti AI, but this is very much AI, right? Yeah, this yeah. is uh, <laughs> this is definitely machine learning. This is AI. We're, we're uh, ten plus years into really trying to understand how to incorporate machine learning into ornithological research and ways to engage people with birds. So we, we try to think like we're the good guys in the AI side of things. So explain like how it works and how you ever populated it and how it can sort through all the background noise or that you could be in a room. I, I, re I realize it doesn't like a ton of unusual background noise, but you can be in a room where people are conversing or on a patio with people conversing and it's picking out some bird off in the distance and like it's just so hard to picture how it's sorting out right like you can sit because you have a you know your ears have kind of a 360 sense of what's going on around you and you're able to sort things by distance but when it's coming through into a microphone like something's losing track of well, that's to my left, right? It gets yep. flattened. Yep. You know, yeah. all the sound so, is flattened into a single sphere. And it's not like, oh no, that's a thing that has nothing to do with this way over there. But the person talking to me is right here. I just can't even picture how you'd begin to get a thing that could pluck it out. Yeah. So one way to think about it is, um, you know, sounds can be converted into a picture. So we basically take, you know, that recording and, it turns into a graph where you've got the time and the frequency mm -hmm. and that will, um, you know, produce a signal. So if a cardinal has got those introductory notes, you can see exactly where all the notes are in the cardinal song. And so what we did is basically look at the, all the recordings in the Macaulay Library Archive or a subset and then, um, you know, essentially train Merlin to identify those recordings by, um, having experts draw boxes around all of the times that a bird sings in that particular recording. So again, we're taking the sound, we're moving it into a picture and then going online and annotating every time a cardinal sings, mm -hmm. every time a chickadee sings in the background. And originally we were just, you know, picking out, okay, if we're trying to teach it how to identify cardinals, we'll just draw boxes around the cardinals. But then we um, realized that if we drew boxes and labeled everything in that soundscape, then Merlin be was able to figure out exactly what was going on in that landscape. That was a jump we didn't really expect, um, but it's really thanks to like all the folks who put those recordings into the archive, and then the experts who took you know hours and hours like in a very time-consuming way um, making those annotations, and then it goes into the machine learning system. Mm -hmm. And so Grant Van Horn is the leading uh, computer scientist on this project, and he's really figured out how you can, um, you know, tweak this system to put those real-time predictions back out. So part of the fun is that Merlin's like lighting up, and and any as any species starts to vocalize, it's um, picking that up, and that's really um, Grant's hard work testing out how to make a system that will do that and also run on a phone. So yep. that's the other really cool thing is that. Um, we've been able to leverage Apple's uh, hardware to put these you know, algorithms right on a device that can work uh, without a connection to the internet. Have you guys been surprised by how many, like it's, it's rate of adoption with users? Yeah, pleasantly surprised. Yeah. yeah. Um, how, like how can you say how many people are out there using it? Um, three and a half million in July. Huh. Um, yeah. On a given weekend. How many turkey hunters? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Turkey was like a little lower on the list of frequently identified birds than I might have guessed, but yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's not all turkey hunters It's not out all there. turkey hunters. Um, so what I, this is the thing that really surprised me. I just assumed that the whole point of Merlin 
was that it would allow ornithologists to get these location-specific, time-specific snapshots of bird sounds. And that any time I was using, I never, you know, I was just like everybody, you never read terms of service. You just are like, okay. Uh, I just assumed that when I had it open and it was listening, that it went into some database somewhere of, of you know, at blank date, at blank time, at blank location, here's what was going on. But you're not doing that. Not yet. That is the next step. Okay. Because uh, that ability to monitor a landscape for like three minutes of a nice recording is going to give us a tremendous amount of information about the species that are there. And so we're going to soon be preparing kind of the eBird, you know, data model and how all that, those observations are handled and incorporate this kind of different type of data into that system. But it's a pretty big jump to go from um, bird watchers putting in a sighting to now here's a basically an automated system collecting that information. So yep. we've got a lot of research and experiments to do, but uh, certainly that's where it's heading. Um, and you can imagine in years to come, you know, putting devices out on the landscape to really monitor oh, yeah, birds and man. spots yeah. where, you know, people don't go very often. And But that's yeah. going on right now, right? Yeah. Because I know yeah. people do it with turkey researchers that just put stuff up to pick yep. up gobbles. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's going to become something that more people can do. And hopefully it doesn't have to be like a researcher putting those devices out, but, you know, somebody backpacking up into the high peaks would be able to do it too. And yeah, or get yourself one of them Chinese spy balloons, man. Yeah, and just that. float that thing around uh -huh. sucking up <laughs> yeah. bird sounds. It'd be great. Yeah. Uh, one thing that we had dinner last night, we talked and, and I've seen it in some of the stuff you guys do. Uh, that with, with the, with the stuff you gather through eBird, and maybe it'll be demonstrated in Merlin, um, that it's just, it seems like you guys say that bird numbers are just declining. And just, that's it. Is that well, true? There's, there's, like, a, like, there's a lot more complexity to it. And I think, I think one of the things that we're able to see now is we have people all around the world you know, there's there's almost a million people who have contributed their sightings to eBird. Uh -huh. They're in every country in the world. And so from that, because they're in different habitats, they're in different geographic locations, they're, they're there all year round, we're able to see not just that a species is necessarily declining, but the sort of tapestry and complexity of how that decline might be taking place. And so it might be that um, some birds... A pattern is that, you know, some birds are shifting their populations to the north with, with climate change. And so that's part of what, what is really interesting for us to figure out is, is just exactly how that's happened. Because then we can start to understand what the drivers or what the causes of these declines might be that otherwise would be really, really hard to, to figure out. I mean, we're, we often think about birds as being the canary in the coal mine, if you will and that they're really good proxies for understanding natural systems overall, because natural systems are very, very complicated. And we wanted to think about how do you kind of measure the heartbeat of the planet and an ecosystem? And it turns out that birds end up being a really, really good way to do that because you have hundreds of thousands of people that are watching birds. They can report the sightings that they see. Then we can take that information, sort of like Orrin was talking about, and link link that other that information with um, remote sensed imagery. So since we know where you are, um, we can link that and then understand information about the habitat at a variety of scales. You know, we can understand what the habitat's like within you know a hundred meters of where you were, within a mile of where you were, and within ten miles. And then we can start to say like, okay, it seems like this bird during the breeding season requires this type of habitat. During another type of um, you know maybe post-breeding, you know, after the young leave the nest and are moving around, they may switch to a slightly different type of habitat. And being able to understand how those connections happen can be really important for conservation. But I mean, are there, you know, I mean, are there as many birds in the U.S. as there was 25 years ago? No, they're not. Okay, that's what I'm trying, that, that's what yeah, I'm trying to ask. But You know, o overall, there's, there's basically... Um, based on some of the the work that teams here and others others did 3 billion birds have been lost in like the last 40 years 3 billion with a b 
of all sorts of of all sorts and i mean it's a very very common it's a it's the most species are declining you know if you go on to our website we we have a science section on there and you can basically go through and for more than 400 species see exactly what's happening and where those birds are declining where they might be increasing so it is it is complex and there are areas that birds are increasing and there are certain species and groups of birds that can that are increasing but the overall pattern right now is one where birds are are really declining particularly things that might be um migrants that are traveling long distances Mm -hmm. um shorebirds grassland birds um those are some of the the major groups of birds that have very very significant declines I was surprised to learn recently that there's only five species of birds that have a global population of one billion. Where did you read that? I read it in a book called Wild New World by the historian Dan Flores. Huh. The English Sparrow. A goal, which surprised me. Um, I can't remember what goal it was. What else is in there? The European starling, maybe. Yeah, there's five species of birds that they think have a global population more than one billion. Yeah, it's measuring the absolute number of birds ends up being a very, very difficult thing. You're not buying this. To, to fi- <laughs> I'm all I'm saying is it's a very difficult thing to figure out. You know, it's actually easier to understand the percent decline in a total population of birds yeah. because you're looking at, at the relative difference than saying sort of the absolute number of birds. Because if you think about some birds like a bald eagle, it they tend to sit out in the open um, or they're flying around. They're big. They're easily detectable. Um, but something like a red-eyed vireo or a Swainson's thrush, I think that's the, ex- the example of a bird that's sort of hiding up in, in the woods. If you're an expert bird watcher, maybe you're hearing that and identifying it as a Swainson's thrush, but a lot of other people wouldn't, wouldn't see those birds. Um, because of those detection differences, um, it can be really difficult to sort of compare one species to another species. And some other birds, you know, if you think about red-winged blackbird, they can have very clumped distributions. So around marshes, they're very, very abundant. But if you get away from their habitats, they're much less common. At certain times of the year, then they gather in massive flocks of, you know, tens of thousands to millions of birds. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's just, it's a very difficult thing to sort of say, this is the absolute number of any species. Yeah, but that's like, you know, it's rough though. Over a billion. Over a billion. Can you, uh, I'm going to look this up, but just to ask, are you surprised because you would think that it would be more than that? Are you surprised to hear there are birds that have a global, that might have a global population? Or you just think that anyone saying that is overreaching? Anytime that, that there's a definitive statement that there are X number of species that meet some threshold that's in comparison to others is often something where I would kind of pause and, and raise my eyebrows and think about just because of the the difficulty in understanding that there's 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 also a lot of systems that may not be heavily covered or where there's a lot of people that are actually going and looking at birds and so just to sort of be able to figure that out is is a complicated you know it's something that i mean that is difficult to to do with a level of confidence that, that you know I'd be comfortable making a statement like, like that. that you'd be comfortable writing into a book. Yeah, I I, <laughs> I probably wouldn't. I probably wouldn't do that. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna follow up with you because we've talked about it. that was even a trivia one of Spencer's trivia questions if I remember <laughs> no, it right. It was maybe I wasn't on that. Something one. about that or no no I think I maybe suggested it to him as oh, a trivia but yeah, question. Okay. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> um, with eBird. You feel that eBird, where people from around the world, how many people use eBird? A there, million? There's yeah, there's about a million people who have used eBird, and in, in you know any year about a quarter million people. So prior to eBird, and, and it seems like you guys are really optimistic about um, what you can garner from that. Prior to eBird, 
how was anyone ever taking a stab at what's going on with bird populations? Yeah, that's a really good question. There's a there's a survey that's been going on in the U.S. for a long a long time called the Breeding Bird Survey, mm-hmm. which is basically a series of of um, of points that people are doing along roads where they go out every spring and they um, they are able to infer what's happening with with bird populations during the breeding season and so that's that's one way that people have been doing it one of the longest citizen science projects is something called the christmas bird count that's been going on for over a hundred years so the idea that you know citizen scientists and people can contribute to science is is not a new idea at all i mean it's something that's been happening for a long time but with the advent of the internet and the ability to exchange information very quickly it's been a lot easier for us to very quickly be able to amass you know over one and a half billion records from all over the world and that scale of large amounts of data then allows us to get much more insight than we would be able to get with with other methods. And one of the things that's exciting now is it's it's not necessarily that we're only using eBird data. We're often integrating that data with other other data sets as well. So we're we're able to bring in some of the information that Fish and Wildlife Service may have gathered and then bring that together with information that we have. But it it turns out one of the things that's a little surprising that people may not um, appreciate is usually people are doing surveys where birds are. And so if you're doing a survey for bald eagles, there tends to be an emphasis on saying, okay, these are, these are places where eagles are. We're going to do my, my, my survey where the eagles are. What happens then is if you're trying to extrapolate that across everywhere and you have no information on where eagles are not, then the models basically fall apart because they you don't have that information. eBird ends up being a really good resource for this because we're asking people to record all the birds that they're able to detect and identify and then put an account for. And that gives us sort of not just information about where birds are, but where they're not. Because you've asked them to enter all birds. Exactly. Yeah. And we know that there's differences between people, right? Like we know if you go out with Jesse, um, you're gonna see you're gonna detect and identify way, way more birds than if you just, you know, go out on your own because she's one of the best bird people in the world. Really? Um, one of the best. Do you have a yeah. life list? Yeah, yeah. Oh I've been keeping a life list since I was nine. Yeah. <laughs> How many birds are on the life list? It's not a really impressive number. It's a couple thousand. But I think the thing that we've done that's what, been... How many are there? 20,000? I don't know. 10,500. 10, There's like 10, one guy birds. who's almost made it to 10,000. Um, but yeah, like... He throws a lot of money at it. Yeah. His life is dedicated to traveling. Um, but the thing we do that's kind of fun is try to figure out how many species we can see in 24 hours. And so, you know, for example, we went down to Texas in April. Who's we? So... The Cornell Lab Morphology actually has a birding team. Where you guys compete. We do compete, and but you know, conservation always wins. We're raising money for <laughs> conservation. Okay. So um, donors pledge, you know, traditionally by the number of species that we would see, and um, we would spend you know a week planning a route to like pick up as many birds, and then take twenty four hours to run that route, time down to the minute, to see how many. Birds we could and you get hit a lot of day. coastal areas, probably. Yeah, right? so you're you're getting the coastal areas. You're gonna get, you know, the grasslands or any habitat you can put on that route. Um, it's kind of the goal because you know different habitats you're gonna get different species and, and you gotta see them or hear them. Either is good. Um, and one of the other rules is that um, 95% of the species all team members need to see. So if you got five people on the team, you're trying to make sure everybody's picking up all the birds all day long. So it's not just like one guy can, you know, find them all. And, and what's a good, what's them. a good 24 hour period, a good total anywhere. I mean, you know, 200 or something like that is a, something people work towards in most regions. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's one day in Texas, we pulled off 294 species and set the record for North America. That's working your asses off. Yeah. Yeah. How many? 294. Two, yeah. In one day in Texas. One day in Texas on a really epic migration day. So we had watched the weather. We knew that there, you know, a front was coming in. Um, 
which was dropping birds on the Texas coast. Uh, but the conditions were, were really good that year. We had some lingering waterfall that wasn't expected to be in the region and then just a lot of practice. But on those days, you get to put your birding skills to the test by like finding things that weren't expected on the route and just being the first guy to like pick the Merlin flying over the unexpected peregrine is yeah. part of it's, fun. It's really similar to hunting in a lot of ways, because what you do is, you know, the, the you spend this time scouting and understanding exactly what, it, you know, in this case, about 300 species of birds are doing, sometimes to the level of that individual. Like if it's something that's rare in a region, you know, maybe there's a cinnamon teal that's that's lingering that wouldn't usually be in that area. You know, it's not just that it's there. You kind of need to figure out, well, like, when is it actually like swimming out where you can see it versus hiding in the in the reeds? And so you have people that that are basically trying to get these very intimate understandings of exactly what's happening, sometimes with individual birds. Mm -hmm. And then there's also kind of the magic that happens, you know, like, like when you're hunting, that's just completely unexpected, like something that you didn't know was there happens. And so there's this element where you sort of know there's some things about these birds at a place that, that you're, you're trying to put those birds together on a route. But then there's also you know that you can create almost opportunities around dusk and dawn in particular, where you know things are moving more, you know that there's these different factors. And so you're trying to sort of fit these things together and, and pull together a route that, you, you know, you see how many birds you can see. You should, we should do one of these together, see if we can have you see 200 species of birds in a day. I'd like it, but I'm trying to think of some things. Have you, have, do you, have you gotten all ptarmigans? Like, in a lifetime, yeah. Okay. Yep, all, we yep. we did in our Alaska Big Bay. Yeah, yeah. We we. Uh, you got all in one day. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. I know friends that have gotten yeah. gotten one all in one day. Nice. That's awesome. Like collected. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do, does anybody? Uh, is that still a thing? Like when people used to go out with their fowling piece and like shotgun birds. Yeah, that's still. Um, there's a limited amount of scientific collecting that goes on. A yeah. limited amount. Yeah, I mean, it, what would be a circumstance where that's still like an acceptable thing to do? Like back in the yeah. you know, Audubon or Darwin days, and they just run around with their fowling piece and like collect right. birds. So these days, museums tend to pick up more salvage birds. Yeah. So birds hit a window, roadkill. Those are going to museums. Um, but there are certain species where there's some really interesting questions around what is driving the changes in their population, mm -hmm. where, you know, if you collect, you know, 10 individuals or even something like that, um, can really start to unlock those questions of how those populations are changing and why, for example. Have you ever been out with someone doing that? Yeah. Yeah. It feel it feel like real kind of naughty. I feel like it, it kind of, it kind of <laughs> does. Cause it's like, like, you've got this very specific permit for just a little bit of sampling and uh, you kind of know in the back of your head, you know, it's been hundreds of years in some of those species since they've been uh, targeted in that way. So. Oh, yeah, for yeah. sure. Several years ago, when I was doing my master's, we uh, had a permit to kill brown pelicans. Uh-huh. And that was pretty, uh, pretty intense. There's a big bird. And they, was, they were collecting them for what purpose? Collecting them for, to look for uh, environmental toxins oh, in them. So there's still toxins. So they would take, you know, a little piece of breast tissue, a little liver, and some brain tissue. The only way to get that is to, you know, you know, go shoot them. Have to do like some mortal. Yeah. yeah. What uh, what birds right now, um, or like in the U.S., what classifications of birds are most imperiled? You hear a lot about grassland, which is uh, you know, I guess obvious because of loss of grassland habitat. But are there classifications of birds where it's just not like clearly understood? things that you guys look at that you're that you're puzzled about shorebirds are are declining pretty rapidly um we have uh we've done some studies on shorebirds in the pacific flyway and it's uh it's almost all bad news there and it, it's hard to know why it could be loss of habitat on the overwintering grounds down mm -hmm. in south america that is a definite possibility crowding on the beaches things like that. Uh, and it could be, you know, breeding habitat up, you know, a lot of these shorebirds breed up in the Boreal regions. Um, and that's, you know, being affected by climate change, things like that. Um, but shorebirds, I would say, along with the grassland birds are, are pretty imperiled. The ones that are more alarming. Yep. Do you know, there was a, um, there was a 10,000 year period 
when basically from the end of the Pleistocene extinctions, there was a 10,000 year period where only one creature that they know about in what is now the U.S. went extinct. And it was some like coastal goose in California. Uh, and then we had, oh, you know, with, with European arrival in the New World, we then launched into this whole other epic of extinctions. But uh, do you think things, like, do you see things that, that would suggest that we're, that we're headed for more extinctions in the U.S. with bird species? Oh man, that's, that's, it's hard to say, you know, there, there, there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of species for which we, we do these trends, these, these, you know, long-term trends that are declining. Um, you know, very few are, are increasing. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it, it, it does seem like more bad news than good. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Um, you know, there are, we, we see, so one of the things you see in, uh, you know, when you do these these studies on population trends, is that you'll see that it's not all decline or all growth. There'll be, um, you know, it, it's spatially, you know, uh, different the the declines and the growth. So they'll be growing in one region, and declining in another. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you maybe that's evidence of of a range shift. Maybe they're declining in one region and growing in another, not because they're dying over here, but because they're moving from one place to the other. I so you see more over here. So sometimes it, it's hard to tease that apart, uh, just looking at this population data. Um, and then, of course, things that are, you know, super reliant on people, like snow geese. We looked at snow geese earlier. Um, you know, the white-fronted geese. Those populations are exploding because of, of farms. They can exploit farms, things like that, whereas other waterfowl aren't doing so well. Um, you know, so it's, uh, it, it's hard to say like that we're heading towards another mass extinction. Mm -hmm. Um, but m more bird species than not are definitely in decline right now. Yeah. What, uh, if you, when you, when you hear about climate, you guys have mentioned climate change a couple of times and it's easy to picture how things can lose from climate changes because shifting habitats and it, and it takes them a long time to adjust to shifting habitats but does wouldn't it have to be that i mean there's got to be like birds who are having new area opened up to them who like who's on the winning end i mean i imagine you know you talk about all these birds that that have worn out from human activity meaning like canada geese have really done well thanks to humans um english sparrows have done really well thanks to humans starlings crows have done well thanks to humans are are there things that uh that you see that you'd see on the increase because there used to be areas that like that, that they had a northern limit that's now opening up to them yeah i think northern mockingbird is one that oh really has, that has pushed north in the last 20 years or so um and it's it's likely due to you know it, it can now tolerate what's going on further north than than its previous range limit so it's opening up habitat. Yep. Yeah. P part of it also is that it's it's often not just climate change and isolation, but also other human land use. So the the what what can happen is when you have sort of changes in climate and the connectivity between habitat has been altered, and so that there isn't that connectivity that there may have that there may have once been. Um, that creates a different type of of problem for, mm -hmm. for birds and other, and particularly less mobile animals to be able to respond to. Um, explain that, like give, give that in terms of a particular bird. Yeah. So if you, if you think about, um, let me, let me think, think if I can come up with something. Um, if you're a grassland bird, I'll, I'll, I'll be sort of general. So it applies more than sort of any specific, but yep. if you're a grassland bird, and you are, um, things are getting warmer. So generally what would happen is you would be shifting to the north. Yep. And you may be doing pretty well in, in things like Pawnee National Grasslands or Comanche National Grasslands or some of these different grasslands that have been set aside. What happens is as, as things become more warmer and warmer, 
that habitat in that place may not be right for them anymore. You always have some percentage of birds that are, are quote unquote, making mistakes maybe, or going to places where they wandering around to varying degrees. And it, it really varies depending on the species, deg the degree to which that happens. But what happens is if there are fewer places nearby for those birds to find, if those are all corn and soybean farms now, mm -hmm. they may not disperse to another area that has sort of the appropriate habitat that you might, that, that you might move to. So it might be like, you know, maybe there is this other habitat that would be, you know, work out really well for them, but they have to get through a whole bunch of other stuff in order to reach there. And there just aren't enough individuals that would sort of quote unquote, figure out that this other place exists. Yeah. I got you. What generally is, uh, do you guys look at rough grouse much? Do, do we have rough grouse on there? Because he, here's the thing that just, that it's one of those kind of frustrating things where you have this bird, it's widely recognized that, or, or the bobwhite quail. It's widely understood that its distribution is shrinking. States that used to have great quail hunting aren't having it now. States that used to have great rough grouse hunting aren't having it now. And you talk to people in Pennsylvania about it, right? Um, and then when you ask someone, well, what's going on? Uh, and I'm not saying people should clean it up, but you say what's going on, and it's like, it's too many things. Or so many things it's unknown, you know? Uh, is there any way to kind of like tackle with rough grouse, for instance, between what you hear about not, is it, uh, what's the, what, uh, what's the mosquito borne pathogen that seems to kill them? West Nile kills a lot. Habitat, right? And you get into quail and some people will tell you fire ants, habitat destruction whatever you know is that is that a thing you guys can speak to at all with some of these birds that just have bad news after bad news after bad news and it's like death by a thousand cuts yeah no, i mean that that's exactly right i mean and usually at least in the u.s and and i think broadly across the world loss of habitat or changes in habitat tend to be the major driver for loss of of number either abundance or in range shifts mm -hmm. Um, then you have additive effects. So as, as forests in the East are maturing, basically what you're having is a, a lot of loss of that early successional habitats that things like American woodcock and ruffed grouse are using. And there's also a lot of, of need to have connectivity between different types of habitats that you may not have to the same degree that, that you once had. And so what, what happens is at different stages in a bird's life, they they need different types of habitat. The reality is 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 that that information we still don't have that for most species. It's really hard to understand exactly what birds need, and then how that varies across both space and time. Most studies tend to be done when birds are most detectable. So, you know, you, you might be able to go out and, and do surveys for one ruffed grouse or, or drumming. You understand a lot about the needs for what ruffed grouse needs when they're displaying. But then you, you know, to go and put, you know, radio, either, whether it's radio telemetry or newer methods of monitoring individual birds is a much more um, expensive time intensive to really understand what's happening. And then there's a question of to what extent does, does what you found out in that study area with maybe 13, 15 birds apply to other areas? Are they using that same thing? Or is it that that's already a, a, a an area that the birds are limited and maybe not doing exactly what they want, but they're doing something that, that they can. And so that's kind of the idea behind eBird is to get enough people that are in every habitat at every time of the year that we can start to understand sort of how these things are playing out and how birds are um, are responding and then figuring out how to how to link that with other types of data on these integrated population models which is really what Oren does a lot but when you when people are using eBird are you asking them about is it a juvenile or not a juvenile or are you just going by the time of year so we're, we're mostly using the time of year, but people 
are able, you know, they can they can take photographs, mm -hmm. upload those photographs in the Macaulay Library. So there's researchers that have used the photos in the Macaulay Library to look at things like what are the percentage of juveniles, how does it compare to the year before, um, understanding that w that the idea is that the relative percentages of what people are photographing from one year to the next should probably be pretty similar. There shouldn't be a, a reason that one year people are really deciding to just photograph juveniles and the next year they're just photographing adults. There should be some ratio that's, that's consistent. And so trying to look at that over time is something that people can do. And then people that are interested, there is a, there's an age and sex grid where people can put how many adult males, how many adult females, how many juveniles. There's, breeding codes that people can enter so they can they can say that this is this is an area where a, a bird had a brood of young that were with it um there's a lot of different information that people can put in beyond just sort of the the species and number of individuals and there are specific surveys run through eBirds. so various states will have their breeding bird surveys done through eBirds. so they will be putting in you know we saw black-throated blue warbler breeding on a nest, you know, or something. We saw this bird with chicks, things like that. And those individual projects that use eBird for that data will absolutely use that stuff to, uh, you know, in their in their studies. There's an annual bird. There's an annual raptor count in a mountain range near our house. I can't remember what date it is, but it's a migratory raptor count. My kids have gone out to participate in it. So th that's the kind of thing that gives you like an annual snapshot. And they probably measure some kind of like thing like effort. Yep. You know, uh, I was asking you guys before, is there ever a birder who's so bad they get 86 off eBird? <laughs> if I haven't gotten booted, then I don't know if anybody will. <laughs> I mean, you're like, there's no way you saw that. You know, there's no <laughs> cock of the rock. You can't keep saying you saw that. No, there, there's no <laughs> cock of the rocks in Ithaca. Um, Usually, it's very, very rare uh -huh. that that we end up um, booting somebody, and usually it's it's for the same reasons that somebody might get you know booted from a social media site, right? It's not it's not that it's an intentional error that mm -hmm. somebody's making. If they're trying to, you know, if somebody says that they saw a rare bird and then they take a photograph that they snatched off the internet of that bird at a different place, you know, in that case. You know, we'll figure it out if, if it's a kid or somebody that's kind of screwing around and, and yeah. just messing around. But that's really, really rare. Usually the mistakes that people are making are kind of honest mistakes. And we have we have methods that allow us to just understand the, the differences and understand that people are learning. And, and what people sometimes forget is these same challenges apply to, to basically any professional survey, too. You're going to have people that... Maybe they all are experts, but for whatever reason, people might be more tuned in and really know certain vocalizations of certain birds. They may focus more on forests. They may understand the grasslands a little bit more. And so we, we're, we're able to, because there's one and a half billion records, we can start to understand those differences and not say, well, dude, this guy's an idiot. We got to... We yeah. get them off right we can still be a pretty inclusive place where where just about everybody can participate and then we can have different weights um in terms of how we use that data yeah we we learn about the individual ebird users um by you know the the time it takes them to accumulate so many species in a particular habitat in a particular region and we can use that in these models just like we do effort uh, to determine, you know, the, uh, the, the expertise, essentially, of, of an individual eBirder. So you, you can tier it out to be, you can tier it out to be people who are like high consistent users scoring a lot and then, and then like audit those individuals in some way or not audit them, but go and look at what they're up to. Yes, and we, we can also do that uh, regionally and seasonally. Like, I'm, I, I would be a pretty decent birder in the northeastern United States, but if I went to Spain, I would be terrible. Um, and we would account for that. Meaning because you'd lose familiarity. Right, I, I would not know most of the birds over there. Are you guys aware of the Himalayan snowcock? Yeah. Okay. So they live in the Ruby Range of Nevada. And some years ago, I was 
uh, thinking about going hunting for one. It's a high effort, low reward kind of thing. Um, fairly low success rates. But I wound up finding online this little birder club. And I don't think they would have done this if they knew there's people like me out there, but there's this little birder club that would talk about where exactly people over the years had seen Himalayan snowcocks, which was gold. Um, I, I haven't gone into eBird and looked, but, but would that be helpful for someone trying to find a Himalayan snowcock in the Ruby Mountains? Yeah, I mean, you can... Because you you'd be like, oh man, two days ago, <laughs> there's one right there. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I think, I think the thing is, is in the U.S., you know, hunting is a highly regulated um, pursuit. People yeah. want to understand what's happening with these birds. And, you know, if anything, what we need is more hunters, more people that are out fishing. The, you know, we were talking about Merlin a little bit earlier about, you know, what are, what are you really using that for? For us, it's this huge engagement window. You know, if one in 70 people in the U.S. have used Merlin in the last, in the last year, that's a lot of people that are being exposed to birds, being exposed to natural systems. And sometimes it's easy to focus on maybe differences that exist either within the birding community, within the hunting community, or between those and, and say, like, there could be points of friction. That, you know, that's certainly true. There also can be incredible points of, of overlap because at the end of the day, we're interested in the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we want there to be natural systems that can support vibrant population of birds and mammals and have natural places. And so, so this is a, there's a lot of benefit, I think, to thinking about, you know, just what are the ways that we can get more people interested in the natural world? Yeah. See, I have persecution complex. Yeah. <laughs> so... When we were talking, you're talking about as your database grows and and Cornell uh, Ornithology Lab and eBird would share information with management agencies, right? Where my head went right away is there's a thing that'll happen now and then. For instance, there was a one of the times recently when it looked like they were uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service will now and then petition to get the grizzly bear delisted. So the, the agency that manages the grizzly bear as an endangered species will occasionally actually move to unload their management, meaning they're saying, as the management agency, we suggest that these be removed from federal oversight. Uh, and they'll get, it'll get litigated. One of the times it seems so close to be moving to state management that a couple states did a draw. They were going to issue, I think Wyoming was going to issue 20 grizzly bear tags. Um, Idaho was going to issue one grizzly bear tag to hunters. Montana um, chicken shit it out and wasn't going to do any. And there was a movement for people to, it was like, hey, go and put in for these. So within the non hunting world, they were encouraging people to apply for the tags, try to get the tags so that they don't fall into hunters hands. So the minute you told me that as per, some of the persecution complex, I immediately thought those sons of bitches are going to under report game birds <laughs> in order to, <laughs> in order to deprive opportunity. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> luckily the, uh, y you know, the, just like the hunting community, there, there can be friendly competition, you know, yeah, yeah. the, the birding community kind of has the same thing. People want to be the person who's seen a lot of different species. Oh, they they so want to have what, high counts. Work in our favor. <laughs> and, and so there's often enough, enough pressure. And I, I mean, I do think that there's a sincere belief too, that when you have better information and can do better science, mm -hmm. you're going to have better decisions that people can, that people can make. And I mean, that's kind of the idea of, of what we're trying to do and that all these people are, are, are trying to help with is, you know, right now state agencies don't have the information that they need. You know, if RAWA passes, how are state agencies going to figure out exactly where they want to make the investment to have the biggest impact? Mm -hmm. um, as we have data sets like eBird, 
I can look at this at sort of comprehensive levels, you can really start identifying like, well, these are the places that, you know, if you want to bring back populations of birds, these are the places where you could focus on and really have impact. And it's a way of figuring out how we take the sort of scarce resources that we have within the conservation community and really use them most effectively. I would just think that like, as I think about it from a citizen scientist tool, um, it just seems to me that the sound recordings are somehow more valuable. Do you know what I mean? Because you're not running it through, you're not running it through, it, it's just less fallible than, than running it through people. I mean, and I'm not trying, and I don't want anyone want to criticize like eBird as a tool, but it, it, let's say eBird had total adoption in America. Okay. So 300 some million Americans are making a daily chore of, of chronicling what birds they see around them. I think it, you'd hit like such at that point, you'd hit that there was just so much information that any, that, that mistakes and things would be drowned out. Right. But I can't picture in its current form how it could be, um, and you know better me, but I can't picture in its current form spread globally that number of people that you could actually like really with confidence make management decisions about it, buy it. Like you even mentioned to me one time, there was a, there, what, what was the bird you were saying when we were talking last night that flies down the center of a waterway and that they would, they would not be reported because they're flying? Well, the- the limitations to the aerial surveys and monitoring. Oh, that, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I get that question all the time. Um, you know, how can we trust yeah. this? Yeah. That's a, that's a quicker way. And, of, that's a quick way of saying is yeah. like, at, how would you ever get to where you trusted enough that you're really looking at bird populations and not that you're looking at human habits? Yeah. Right. That, so that's almost exactly how I phrase it. Is we got to make sure we're modeling the birds and not the birders. Yeah. Right. And we do that with all of the effort that's put in. So we know that if you go out for two and a half hours and you travel three miles, you are far more likely to see a given species than if I'm just sitting on my porch and make a checklist for five minutes. Yeah. Um, we account for that. We account for the expertise like we talked about. So we know, and, and you'll notice on, on our maps, these are relative abundance. We're, we're not estimating actual abundance. Uh, that would be, you know, that, that's, that's a huge ask of, of eBird data. Um, because, you know, in general, people are bad at counting. Yeah. I, um, I get where you're like, dive in a little bit when you say relative abundance. So relative abundance. As, Just so people understand. This yeah. Better. As we have defined it is, uh, it is the average number of species or average number of individuals of a given species, an expert eBirder would expect to see in one of these three by three pixels uh, at the optimal time of day for detection, and that's defined by the model, uh, traveling one kilometer and birding for one hour. So that's a that's a long definition of relative abundance. Well, but hit, that, that's hit, what it is. Hit me with one. Let's take the the red breasted robin. Mm-hmm. Okay, in June. Like, or just give me any kind of example of what, what the number might be. So for ruffed grouse here, we're looking at it. Um, it ranges from, you know, almost nothing to 14 is the darkest purple we can see on this map. Uh, so that would be... Man, I grew up in a really good grouse spot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, so that's, and again, relative abundance, you can think about that as there are more here than there are here. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then this puts numbers to just how many more there are uh, in a given spot. So if, if we look but, at... Yeah, what's interesting about this is you could have, you could uniformly reduce by 50% rough grouse populations and that stays the same because it's relative, right? Yes, yeah. if you just cut it in half. So we can look at one... This is hooded merganser. Okay. So rough grouse are not migratory. Hooded merganser is. So we can see this change across the year. 
And that's what we're looking at here is relative abundance at each week of the year. Uh, Wait, you want to lean back a, a foot, Steve, so we can yep. get a shot. Thank you. Man, this is the thing. So I want to explain to people what we're looking at. We're looking at, this is the court. We're looking at, this is all off eBird. So this is run through some very sophisticated models that account for all those things we've talked about as far as effort and account for uh, environmental variables, different land cover. We have more than 84 variables in this model that mm -hmm. account for things like elevation, um, weather. We have hourly weather in this model um, attached to a checklist. We've got various water layers. Um, we have tidal layers, mud flats, those kinds of things. We have all kinds of things that are accounted for in this to make sure that we're not just modeling where people go, but where they're actually seeing these birds. Yeah. What, what you can watch here. And so if people go to Ebra, they can find all this. Yes. Yeah. What you're watching here is, is like a color coded map showing bird densities as they migrate across the continent. And, um, a thing I like about when I talk about like human error is when they're all gone, they're all gone, right? Meaning when, when everything migrates north, you're not seeing like little mistakes pop up. Or is that because they've been filtered out? They may have been filtered out by the modeling process. I see. Because at, you know, where we are here in, uh, you know, June or July, end of June is where we are now, you're not going to see any hooded mergansers on the, the Texas Gulf Coast. Yeah. You shouldn't. Um, that, that's the thing that surprises me is that the, that the migrations are so complete that you don't have more where just like some for some weird reason hangs around, you know? And there may be a report or two from there. Yeah. Um, but if it's just a report or two, the way the modeling works, the way there's all this spatial filtering that goes on to make sure that you know, because if there is a hooded merganser there at this time of year, a lot of people are going to go see it. And a lot of people are going to put that on their checklist. So it, in the raw eBird data, it's going to look like, you know, several hundred people saw a hooded merganser in that one spot that day. We're only going to use one of those checklists across that week. Oh, I, so we I filter that saying. stuff yeah. out. Okay. Right. That so, makes sense. Yeah. So that, you remember, what was it a few years ago last year? Some bird showed up. Off the northeast. That's Stellar Sea Eagle. Yeah. The Stellar that Sea Eagle. Everybody was going to see. Yeah. Yeah. And what. So what, were people, when that Stellar Sea, like he took a wrong turn or screwed something up, right? And he yeah. wound up off the north. Yeah, so he he was, wound up off New England or something, yeah, right? Yeah. Bird, a bird in Japan probably jumped over, went into Alaska, kept going, going across, and then wound up in the northeast, maybe went down to Texas, maybe went back up. That bird then is something that, you know, there's only one of them. In the U.S., so if you want to see that, you got to go a lot on eBird. Yeah, I mean, at times, hundreds of reports of <laughs> that mean, individual bird. Our team was birds. like gone. Yeah, yeah. like half the yeah, team the just was left. Empty. Oh, you guys yeah. went to look. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh hell yeah! <laughs> Did you really? Uh, we actually didn't because we had to manage a bunch of stuff, so we weren't able to go. But most but people, people on our team. Oh, yeah. So most you know people, people that left to go see that bird. Yeah, oh yeah, like and got then, in their car right away as soon as it was found. And then when it changed states. They wanted, not only did they want to see it in Massachusetts, they wanted to make sure that they saw it in Maine. Yeah. Because what's the advantage of that? Because it's have just, different state lists. It's list. cool. It's, it's different fun. lists. It's the yeah. same, it's the same thing like, you know, why would you want to, you know, maybe shoot different, different species of animals? Like it's, in it's different the cave. states? I don't know. <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Steve, I mean, different subspecies, can, coos whitetail. We, we can sponsor, we can, we can initiate the sport of. Of pro competitive oh, you know what? what am I bird saying? Watching. It's a huge thing because, yeah, I am guilty of that. I'm real interested in what states I got a turkey in. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah, you're right. Same you're thing. Right. No, I, mean, yeah. It is, yeah. I thought it was dumb, but now then, I think it's smart. But, but what, ends up, <laughs> yeah. what, what ends up being pretty cool here, though, is when you have all those people that are going to see that, that stellar seagull at some place, what happens is we can start to understand something about the sensor network, so the group of people that are going there, and how their lists are different between them. So they're all there. They all are focused on Stellar Seagull, but we're asking them to give us a complete list of all the birds that they see. So we can start to tease about those differences that are between the observers 
to understand the, the actual natural biological signal by, under, by having people go and see those. So what we try to do is think strategically, like how do we use some of these unusual circumstances to our advantage to be able to tease apart the differences between biology and, and human behavior? So have you, I feel that that would be a great example of somewhere where you could really spend a lot of time um, on demographics, human demographics, okay? So let's say you didn't follow the news, right? You don't follow the news at all. And, and all of a sudden, it's just that there's this huge sudden population of stellar sea eagles in Maine, okay? Would you look at that in a, it's kind of two different questions, but would you look at that and, and, and immediately think, that's got to be a single bird. You just would. You 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 would because we we understand basically with an eBird, you know, we have all we have all this data now to tell us where birds are across time and space. Mm -hmm. We know what the maximum count ends up being and so when we look at something like that, we can we can see the difference between when something might be a a phenomenon caused by weather or something like that. So there's there's been other cases where there's birds like shorebirds, let's say, where there've been several different individuals, all of a bird that's usually pretty rare. In this case, we could say something like Northern Lapwing. It's a European species that's, that's usually, it's migratory there. Mm -hmm. Very, very rare that it makes it over to the US. But sometimes you can have these storm systems that can blow those birds over here. In that case, what we can see is that there might be counts of three birds at one place, five birds at another place, and we can understand sort of how those birds are moving. And so if, and, and because they're rare and unusual events, people want to take pictures of them because they're noteworthy. And so I then we you. can actually go in and, and really dive in and say, okay, like, let's look at the molt pattern on this on this bird and look at the exact wear on the tertials. And so we've been able to look at, you know, in the case of that sea eagle, as people were seeing at different places, you know, we didn't just sort of make the assumption that it was the same bird. People looked at the exact feather wear to understand like, okay, it looks like this is the same bird because look at this scapular feather and this weird pattern that it has. It's very unusual, just in the same way that, you know, we, we can do with people. You know, it's a lot harder to do with birds, but when you're just looking at sort of one or two individuals, all of a sudden you can really, you know, given the photographic equipment that people have available, we can really understand that with a lot of detail now, which is pretty cool. Uh, how many, have you ever looked, how many individuals logged that bird? You know, I haven't, I haven't looked. Yeah. Do you feel it'd be hundreds it's, of it's users? Thousands. Thousands, 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 thousands of users. Yeah. yeah. Got to hit off that bird. Yeah. Uh, has you guys ever yeah. seen that? You, get, you didn't go look, but is that bird on your bird list? No, it's no. not, which is even more, <laughs> That's makes it more, I mean, this is annoying. not a, this, this would be like, it's, you know, we, I have seen Snowcock. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> in, 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 in the, the Ruby's? In the Ruby Mountains. You did? Yeah. Cause it's a, you know, part of it You'll is. tell me where later on. I, we'll, 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 was we'll it compare close or notes. flying away? It was, it ended up getting close. Yeah. Hmm. And what's, I mean, part of it is, you know, whether it's birding or hunting, like it's an excuse to go and, and spend some time in, in kind of a magical place. And, you know, the, the focus might be there on some specific thing, but sometimes what you remember the most from that may not even be related to that. So, you know, going yeah, up yeah. to that, you know, glacial lake, seeing rosy finches and pine grosbeaks, beaks. And I mean, it's just that it's a pretty cool, magical place. And, you know, whether it's hunting or fishing or birds like you, it's just this excuse to go and spend some time in a natural system and smell the crisp air in the morning and, and, you know, listen to the, the natural world and sort of detach from the, the day to day, which, you know, yeah. sometimes isn't great. Uh, my dad had, he ranked all birds into two rough categories. Uh, there was game birds and there was Tweety birds. <laughs> And just the, uh, and that was the thing, like we, growing up, man, you knew some birds, but it was just, there was, yeah, there was the ones that you hunt for, you know, and then the ones that you didn't. And, um, and man, I list, I missed so many good opportunities to learn birds and I still struggle with like identifying all the hawks 
up high, you know, and people that can do that, I'm jealous of that shit bad, you know. Do you guys allow, uh, do you allow yourselves as professional ornithologists to have favorite birds? Yeah. Of course. Yeah. What's your favorite? Yeah, my favorite is a long-tailed duck. Oh. Yeah. I mean, they... Yeah, I grew up on the shore of Lake Ontario, and there were just hundreds of them out there all winter long. So I just loved that experience watching them throughout the winter. And then knowing that they were traveling all the way to the Arctic and completely changing their plumage over, getting those all black heads and everything. Just, Mm -hmm. you know, even as a 10-year-old, I was like thinking, man, wouldn't it be cool to go all the way to their breeding grounds and imagining the migrations that they do? And so that's, that's my favorite bird. Did you grow up knowing that bird by a different name? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, my family still is like. (laughs) They still? Old squad coming over. For sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's uh, um, that we know we had quite a few of those in some areas in Michigan. You'd have quite a few of them, and, and uh, adoption of the new name is not widespread. Yeah, it's a mixed, <laughs> very mixed rate of adoption. Yeah. So that's yeah. one you like. What one you like? Favorite. It's tough for me. I mean, I I don't. I tend to be you know whatever I'm looking at is 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 special it's like you know who's your favorite kid right like there's oh, there's something <laughs> <laughs> who, who is it depends what one i'm talking to <laughs> they always ask <laughs> what <laughs> no i mean if to, today there's a there's a big owl great gray owl yeah i know that, that, one. that yeah it's it's just you know it's a it's an indicator of some of the you know really nice boreal forests um really really cool bird you don't see them very often. Sometimes they stage these eruptions, you know, into Michigan or Minnesota, Wisconsin. Um, I was fortunate one year to go up there during one of these big eruptions and saw over 200 in a day. And, huh. and you know, just just birds and, you know, anytime you see things, it, it has you ans- ask these questions like, you know, what's what's driving that? Are they mostly young birds? Are they one-year-old birds? And, you know, you, you just start looking at things and thinking about things in a different way you know, a different way. Um, mention that. I remember one time I could even tell you the owner of the field and the, uh, there was a, there was a farm family, the Zeldon rust family. And one day there was a snowy owl. So this is a Michigan, you know, a snowy owl sitting in their field. And like, that was the thing people went to watch, you know? Oh yeah. And then I remember, um, my brother Danny hitting a great horn to ha- he hit it it hit him and did real damage on a car (laughs) like broke the grill out of the car and stuff you know hitting that thing yeah and like you it's funny the way you get certain like bird interactions burned into your head i remember being a little kid one day and um, even though we had a lot of rough grouse like just seeing a rough grouse in the yard which is the least rough grousey looking the you know like on a like on a mowed lawn right yeah. And it burns in your head in a weird T- way. Totally. Yeah. We had this, um, right when COVID started, I, I remember the lab basically had just closed. Everybody brought their stuff home. We knew we were entering this sort of new space. And, and I was like, well, you know, at least we've got this rough grass right outside our house that's drumming. And it was just like, you know, the world is, is a bunch of terrible stuff that's happening right now. But we have this grouse. And then... uh the next day it's morning, we're, we're drinking coffee, you know, and, and we hear this <laughs> <laughs> and we, on the second story, we go up there and there's this roughed grouse that's sitting there. Well, of course, Jesse, she's, she's dead. She's pretty, dead. Ex- it's dead. On the it way is, dead. It is dead yeah. on the roof. Oh, um, why on the roof? Well, it hit, there's sort of a, you know, there's the bottom level of the, the roof and then an upper roof. And so it hit the, the window on the second story oh, and fell I down. Got, yeah, I got you. And, um, and so Jesse was also, you know, we were traumatized, but she was also pretty excited <laughs> that we would be able to have the rough grouse for the rough grouse for dinner. Yeah, because times are getting hard. Society <laughs> might have, society <laughs> might have <laughs> dissolved. Exactly. Yeah. That was but the week was, you couldn't find onions in the store <laughs> <or anything. laughs> <laughs> but it was, you know, it was this thing that was just like crushing. I was like, the world really is, you know. And and then the next day, luckily, there was a, it wasn't our roughed grouse. That, oh, and it was another bird that was, was moving through there. So then I was like, okay, Jesse, we can, I'm okay eating that, eating the grouse tonight. No. What's your favorite bird? I, you know, I, I love waterfowl, um, but I, I would say my, my favorite bird is probably reddish egret. 
really uh, growing up on the mm. on the Gulf Coast. Uh, seeing them was was special because they're they're. I'm not going to say they're rare where I where I was uh, on, in Alabama on the Gulf Coast, but uh, you're not going to see a ton of them when you're out. And they uh, they they'll run like wind sprints to stir up the water, confuse fish, and then they'll shade the water with their wings and do this weird little dance and then pick fish out. It's just they're a, a, you know blast to watch. We used to have a when we were kids. My dad would use a for a live well. He'd use the washing machine agitator like the like so it's a those old steel perforated tanks that was inside old washing machines and it had that center at that center piece in it but he just take those out and set them in the water because they're perforated in steel and that would be the live well so when you caught bluegills we'd throw our bluegills in this perforated tank that just sat in the water and then when there got to be enough of them in there you'd go clean all the bluegills and we used to watch um, blue herons and they would never figure out that those things couldn't get away and they would stalk that tank you know <laughs> from 50 yards away like every morning he'd land there and stalk that tank and look up over the edge and so careful and you might be like he's just sitting there just grab it you know but he'd make his strike and grab it you know but my favorite bird man is, I, I think it transcends birdness but it's a turkey yeah wild turkey yeah almost the national symbol yeah well you know what's funny we just talked about this today yeah and it wasn't no it wasn't really but oh you know you know it's a good it's a good (laughs) story it's a good story it's a good story (laughs) so you know that whole deal that he was being like a little bit he was being cute yeah yeah so um ebird's free participation's free merlin's free uh we're with uh we're with I told you this, but we were with um, a famous documentarian the other day, and I was talking about how much I liked Merlin, and he asked how much it was. And I told him it was free, and he said, well, I'm going to get it because I don't buy anything on the internet. <laughs> 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 so it's free. And you don't even spy on people. No, no. We just want people to go out and look at birds and enjoy the natural world and care more about this stuff, yeah. Well, it's effective, man. I have um, – it is uh, – yeah, I've learned a ton about birds, man, from nice. from doing it. I need to start remembering them better, but I've learned I've learned a ton about birds. Yeah, it's easy to kind of get those answers from Merlin and then not really think about it again. So yeah. we're thinking about features that would be fun to like, you know, test those skills over time to help and you actually help you get really it stick in your head. Yes, yeah, I'll tell you what though, it it is uh, so satisfying, even though you don't recall the name. It is so it it scratches the biggest itch. Yeah. To hear something off in the trees and then finally be able to put a name to it. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times it's some bird you heard about, yep. you know, but yep. you just, you just didn't like, know. Oh, that's what that sounds yeah, like. You uh, didn't know what it was. Yeah. So it's great. And I love, um, you guys put out so much great stuff no, thanks. at the Ornithology Lab. Yeah. It's impressive. So I encourage people to go and get and participate in iBird. eBird? eBird, not <laughs> iBird. Participate in eBird and over log stuff you like to hunt. <laughs> no. I'm joking. Don't overlog stuff. Don't like mess with the science. We need <laughs> the science to stay true. true. <laughs> and for you, um, and for you, uh, Nevada Ruby Mountain hunters, keep keep logging them in because someday I'm going to come look for one. Did you log yours? Yeah, they're in there. I think. It's in there. Yeah, I think there might be a photo. Really? Dude, you might regret that, man, because people want to know where those birds are. They're not native, though. Non native. No. Yeah. Um, and you guys want to throw in that I failed to ask about that you think I should have asked about? You haven't been playing as much trivia lately, so Craig and I thought it'd be fun to like just toss in some extra. So you're gonna throw me bird sounds. You. We're gonna throw you some bird sounds and uh, uh, audience play along. Yep, play along. There's a couple warm ups for you that you know, like easy ones. Yeah, easy ones. Okay. <laughs> like a mallard. Hit me with a mallard. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's actually really tough because they sound a lot like a black duck. She would have played like black duck. Yeah, don't do don't do any kind of trick stuff. <laughs> I know this one. You totally know that one. Yeah, why do I know that one? Most frequently heard in June. 
northern region bird. I mean, I know it, but I can't tell you what it is. I don't know. Yeah. Think Will about it, caribou. Yeah. You'd oh. be, You're on a yeah. caribou hunt. A Jaeger? <laughs> Will Tarver. Oh, Tarver. Yeah, Will that's Tarver right. That's right. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, we used to um, remember like uh, remember the Three Stooges and Curly to have that. Nyah, nyah, nyah. Yeah. yeah, we used to talk about it sounds yeah. like curly, like, nick, yeah. Nick, 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 nick. yeah, I forgot about that one. I told you I wasn't going to do it. Yeah, okay. All right, all right. I know that bird. <laughs> I know that one because that's the one up high in the treetops. Yep, that's that, that one. It's a, uh, um, yeah, he lives up in the canopy in the old growth forest. V- the, the Vireo? Swainson's Thrush. Sw- yeah. oh, Swainson's Thrush. Okay, Swainson's Thrush. Yeah, so Swainson's Rush is in the old growth and, you know, across the North America and the breeding grounds, and then they yeah. go all the way to South America for the winters. They wow. do? Yeah. So they're going to be So flying. that one is the one that when you're bear hunting in Southeast Alaska, it's always it's doing everywhere. that. And, I, yeah. and that's one of the ones I wanted to zap with Merlin. Right. Because I, wa- I wanted to zap with Merlin to find out what it was. And I was totally satisfied, but then forgot what his name was. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, these guys are going Swainson's into thrush. the Andes for the winter. So you imagine them flying at night, oh, shit, almost really? nonstop, all the way uh, down to those spots. So, you know, when we th- we're thinking about protecting habitat, it's not just, you know, where they're breeding up in North America, but also working with groups in Colombia and Ecuador and Peru to make sure that the wintering grounds are protected for these species and the stops that they have in between. So a lot so of those the, birds you're listening to in Southeast Alaska are going to South America. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things to notice that, that Jesse was talking about is you can see how small the wintering range is. And when they come back to breed, you see how huge it is. Yeah. They really um, disperse. Yeah. So, so that's that's why it's important to get this this full annual cycle picture, so we can, you know, really pinpoint where they are down here, uh, to to help you know conserve habitat and whatnot. Steve, for listeners at home, what are you seeing? Oh, so he, it's uh, what it, it goes along the the face of the Andes. So it's all across the you know, all across the north, north a little bit north of the boreal forest, right? But like from coastal Alaska, all across Canada, but then when they migrate, they consolidate around the Andes in South America. Is that down the spine of the Andes or the or the yep. east face? It's the spine of the Andes, and some like you know some, some more north, but they really concentrate down there. And then they're and then they're Pacific to Atlantic across the Arctic or across the north. God, man, they're like they're like a global, but not global, but just using huge amounts of territory. Yeah, yeah, it's really impressive. There's a lot of opportunities for vulnerability. Exactly. Yep. And uh, you think about, you know, hmm. a bird like that migrating. They've got all those challenges along the way, whether it's you know window strikes or big storms or you know not having enough food before they take off on a long flight. There's lots of things that are contributing to you know major challenges. For yeah, them a lot survive. has to go right to get yep. from the southern end of that range to the north. Um, okay, I'm going to memorize that bird on the Swainson Stretch. Swainson Stretch. Okay, so this one, just guess like what state it was recorded. <laughs> 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 just pick state. Nevada. <laughs> <laughs> so this one is Hawaii, and it's a, oh. a pretty special song. So you can hear it's kind of jazzy, bubbly. There's some pauses in there that's kind of interesting. And so this is the recording of a kawaii o'o. Oh, okay. And o'o's um, were a family of birds that lived on the Hawaiian Islands, but they were hunted by the Polynesian emperors because they liked their feathers for the robes. They lost their habitat to cattle ranching. And pretty soon there was only one species of o'o left, the kawaii o'o. And that bird that we were listening to was the last guayo. Oh, it is? The last male to ever live. Aww. And so he would sing. Oh, play him again? Yep. That's the last of its kind. Who recorded that? This was a uh, Thane Pratt, 1988. <laughs> and when you hear it again, it takes on this whole new meaning, right? It's kind of melancholy. And you hear those spaces in between the notes, 
And that's where the female would have completed the duet. So OOs were a duetting species. And we're only hearing half the song. We don't really know what the oh, full God. song <laughs> looks like. In 88. 88, yep. 1988. Wow. Yep. I don't know. I, I, know, I didn't know a bird went extinct in, in 88. Yeah, it's this isn't, you know, a bird that's well known. There's still a lot of stories out there like that are, you know, the Exclamo curlew went extinct in, you know, probably the mid 1900s, but um yeah, these are all sad stories that we're losing these species, but they're really meant to be inspiring that there's still an opportunity to save some of the species that are declining now. Mm-hmm. Um Well, and that and that Kauai, oh, oh, you know, as people figured this out, um and this bird was kind of rediscovered in in this area. It really did start to focus on conservation of the of of co- both in Kauai and other Hawaiian islands, and trying to figure out how you pull together these partnerships of groups like the Nature Conservancy states um, to think about and you know how you how you can set aside habitat, create connectivity to move um, for birds to to be able to move, um, and oftentimes. You know, it's it's birds that are the things that first highlight that there's something that could be going wrong in a system. And so while, while Kauai O'O is, you know, it's the first fa- the first family of birds that we've lost, um, you know, really in modern times where it's it's not just that individual species, but as you go up and it's not just, you know, the genus that those birds were in, but a, a fairly long lineage of, of birds that... You know, all of the representatives of them are now gone. Um, that that power that birds have, you know, now when you hear that sound and that bit of knowledge that you have, that it's human actions that have caused that to take place, you know, really has this change, you know, that I think when you hear that sound now um, is the power of birds and, and the ability to say like, oh my gosh, this is this is not a sustainable way that we're living. Mm-hmm. This isn't going to be, it's certainly not sustainable for them. They're gone. It's probably not sustainable for us. We really need to change our behavior. And then you can look at things like bald eagle, you know, that the same thing was happening to populations of bald eagle, or, you know, you may find this hard to believe, but Canada goose, you know, you look sure, at Maxima yeah. Canada goose, the success or maybe even over success of the effect that human action can have when we understand sort of what's happening. You know, people are people are pretty amazing. We can screw things up real well, but we also have the power to change our actions, um, you know, protect natural places, restore the places that we've lost, and then change the way that we're living with natural systems. Yeah, my, uh, you know, my dad was a hunter in the late forties, early fifties, and their ideas and attitudes about geese were so different. And it's, for a long time, there was a goose on a sand County almanac. Yeah. Do yeah. I mean, it was like a special thing. Yeah. And he wrote all about like the call, of the goose, you know, and now people are like, just go golfing, dude. It's all you hear, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Is there more? Yeah. We got, here's one. Uh, yeah. I haven't got any right yet. It's branching out. So. <laughs> So you can hear the Swainson's thrush in there. There's lots of stuff. I'll give you a hint. It's not a bird. Jess is trying to. Oh, it's not a bird. She's she's trying to. She's trying to trick you. I don't know, like a porcupine. I don't know. A beaver. (laughs) Oh, it is really. Yeah. So I uh, dropped that microphone on the top of a beaver lodge. Oh, you could hear him in there. And then you're hearing the kits in the lodge. Yeah. Yeah, My wife was telling me about the. Yeah. My wife was listening to recordings of what they sound like. I was like, that's not true. She's like, no, man, they're vocal. You know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Like for the whole hour, they just kept doing that. But. Let me hear that again. My wife was playing it. Playing that for me. Where is that? That's um, about 300 miles north of Toronto. Okay. Yeah. yeah, my wife was talking about how much noise beavers make, and I was like, no, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't know until I dropped a microphone on the top of the lodge. Uh, but then, like, one more kind of out there. That's a bomb falling. 
<laughs> Not quite. <laughs> I thought it was a spaceship. It's the UFOs they've been talking about. Oh man, I have no idea. That's crazy. Yeah, so though. this is bearded seal. Oh, that's a bearded seal. Recorded with a hydrophone. Yep, oh, underwater. That's, that's, yeah. that's awesome. Turns out they're starting to sing louder now that there's more industrial noise uh-huh. you know, under mm. water. The, the seals are increasing their volume to try to compensate. Good. <laughs> <laughs> that's great noise. Be loud and proud. What I get? Zero? <laughs> <laughs> but are you glad I, you played? You no, know? I'm glad I played. I got a zero, and I think that there's a problem in my brain with, um, like, there's a problem in my ba- brain with remembering, uh, you know, like, assigning noise. Well, you know, it might help you to look at the spectrograms in the Merlin app. Because if you're more visual, you can kind of start to see the pattern of notes, like, in a picture, which really oh, helps me remember them. Help, so, yeah. yeah. But, but um I can do I can listen to FM radio and tell you what song it is three three beats in. But more, but more, more, pra- more practice. <laughs> it's just yeah. practice. Yeah. Yeah. Familiarity. Yeah. Just swab out your like yeah, your your uh Oh yeah, you'd be like poison music. Yeah, your music <laughs> while you're driving around and just put on bird sounds. That's what I did. <laughs> well, that's great. Thanks for yeah. thanks for doing that. Well thank you very much for coming on. I hope people keep uh I hope people go and get the tools and start logging their bird stuff um, and be like a citizen scientist, man. Yeah. Well, we'll see you on there. Will you? Yeah. Will you be able to look up my stuff and check my work? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll check. Give you some feedback. <laughs> You're doing it wrong. We got, a, we, got a team in, we got a team in Montana that'll probably be in touch. Oh, really? <laughs> if you, oh. Yeah. If you, report, if you report that cock of the rock, you, they, you, they will definitely you. flag you. Oh really? Though this, yeah. so they monitor it. Yeah. We we keep we do keep a list of um, we do keep a list of the birds we see in certain areas, and we keep a good list of the birds we see in our yard. Yeah. And what was funny is the other day I heard um, I was on the phone with someone. I was on a work call, and I was hearing this bird. I was like, man, I don't think that's a, like it was like a hawk in a tree, but it didn't quite sound like a red tail. But doing that like. Err, err, again and again and i actually at one point said i have to go for a minute i'll call you right back hung up the call opened up merlin because i couldn't weirdly i couldn't open it up while i was on the phone oh yeah the that was irritating the, the audio cuts out yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me, yeah yeah so i was pissed about that so <laughs> i hung up my call turned it on that bird quit doing that noise Called the person back. The minute I got him back on the phone, it started up again. Hung up, turned it back on. The bird quit. After the call, I took. I told my kid to take that phone. And I said, I want you to go over in the neighbor's yard and find out that bird. And he came back a while later said he never did it again. Oh, so no. to this day, it's still a mystery. <laughs> 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 but I was going to add it to the, the Ranella family list, but wasn't able to do it. Um, all right, but thank you guys very much. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, thank and, you. And thank thanks for having us. Thanks. I hope that you're able to solve uh, problems and, and, and um, help us make good habitat decisions. Yeah. Well, it takes a team. Yeah. To save, to save America's birds. So thank you very much. 